Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. You know, Mary didn't have to say yes. Notice in the reading of the gospel how respectful Gabriel is with Mary. When she hears the message from Gabriel, she is reasonably skeptical. She doesn't passively receive the word, but instead she asks, how can this be? Gabriel explains, and I'm, I'm sure Mary didn't understand what he was talking about, uh, but she chooses then and only then to say yes. The traditional label for this passage in scripture is the Annunciation. And even in that title, which appears exactly nowhere in scripture, we get a more than passing whiff of how the story has been taught for many, many years. It goes like this. God chose Mary, Gabriel announced that to her, and in the way all we women are taught from an early age to succeed, she submits and does what she's told. I notice that in the first part of this chapter, Gabriel has also visited Zechariah with the message of another miraculous birth. Zechariah and his wife, Elizabeth, who are elderly and childless, are about to become parents themselves. Like Mary, Zechariah says, how can this be? And interestingly enough, Gabriel's response to him is quite different. He says, Gabriel says, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, you will become mute, unable to speak until the day these things occur. Well, that's something of a gender role reversal, isn't it? Usually the woman is silenced. But Gabriel allows Mary to speak and to continue speaking. I don't know why the difference. I suspect the person whose body is involved has the right to ask. We see that asking in Jesus too. Jesus, whose body will be the vessel of salvation, also asks in Gethsemane. You remember, Father, is there any other way? But if not, I say yes. Who gets to do what with Mary's body or Jesus' body or this body? These are actually not the right questions. If they were, Mary or Jesus or we would simply be objects of God's actions. The question is, what is Mary being invited to participate in? And what's her answer? To what does she give her consent? It's a lot of talk about bodies and that's important. We are a body, the body of Christ. And this body is being invited to something, something God is doing that has never been done before. And we have some legitimate questions about that. What are we being invited to participate in, church? And what is our answer? To what will we consent? When we hear again the story of Mary's yes, we can take courage. God invites us to be participants in some great transformation within this body and God waits for our consent. Mary's story is an encouragement and she acts as a guide for us. We often see ourselves as having things done to us, of having no agency. We might consider ourselves the object of other people's choices and we're left feeling powerless. The father who was emotionally abusive, the coworker, who was promoted over you, though you deserved it. The unfairness of racial inequity born truly in the bodies of our black and brown siblings. Now, please don't hear me saying all that is good and God is only doing something wonderful 
if you'll only uh, submit to it, that would be the old interpretation of Mary's yes. What I am saying is that in the context of these very painful things, God extends an invitation to us. We can, in that pain, be partners with God in giving birth. COVID, of course, is the context in which we find ourselves. I have heard the fear in your voices about what this means for our future, for our economy, for our children's education, and for the future of St. Simon's. I've heard all of us describe this as something being done to us, in which we are passive receptors of circumstances and events. What if we shifted this? What if Gabriel stood right here and said, hail you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. You can be darn sure we would be much perplexed. But what if Gabriel went on? Don't be afraid, St. Simons. You have found favor with God. And now you will be God's partner in creating something unknown to you. The body of God's son will begin in you and in these events. Frankly, I'm not quite sure how to play out this possibility because I'm not Gabriel and I do not stand in the presence of God. But I suspect the new life we are being invited to gestate in the church will be a change as great as the Reformation. A new church no one could possibly have imagined emerged from that time. A chaotic and frightening time, to be sure. That change came at a high cost. And the body of Christ was reborn. So, here we are in the last days of the year of our Lord 2020, on the fourth Sunday of Advent, invited to this participation. And we ask, how can this be? It's a legitimate question. And by inviting us to participate and waiting for our consent, God transforms our passive reception of these historic events into the possibility of active participation and partnership. You know, sometimes we do see that we have agency, but our consent is costly and therefore frightening. So sometimes God invites and we say no. Think about a time you were with others, maybe friends, maybe family or coworkers, and someone made a racist comment. Just sit with that for a sec. There is a cost to accepting God's invitation to participate in God's justice. Maybe you felt uncomfortable. Maybe you didn't want to embarrass the person or risk being silenced yourself, risk being told it wasn't that big a deal, what's wrong with you? So maybe you just let it go. That's one specific way I bet all of us have said no to God's invitation. I know I have. And God didn't force a yes out of you or of me. God just moved on, invited someone else into that partnership. The invitation to bear God to the world changed Mary's body. Pregnancy will do that. The invitation to gestate this body of God's son, should we give our consent, will change us. It will be costly and it will be frightening, just like it was for Mary. Scott Erickson in his book, Honest Advent writes, all great stories come at a cost and the cost of revelation is that it's going to ask something of us. 
In any divine annunciation, you receive revelation as a gift, yet at the same time, you receive notice that all you had planned is ending. It's all over. Everything will change. Most of all, you. I do not like to hear that, and that scares me. This Advent, we've talked about expectation, preparation, restoration, and now participation. And maybe this is where we'd be more comfortable just taking a step back. Perhaps in our fear of this unknowable change and its unforeseeable consequences for the church, we should say no. God would respect that. I wanna tell you something that I believe and I believe it from my core. I believe God would like to take our fear that says no and transform it into fear that says yes. That's the definition of hope, looking at the unvarnished, frightening realities in front of us, be they personal or in our community, our nation, or in St. Simon's, looking at those frightening realities in front of us, unmitigated by platitudes or wishes, unflinching in our gaze, and say yes to whatever God is doing through them, knowing this historic time to be God's invitation to you and me to participate in what God is doing. My siblings in Christ, like our sister, Mary, the God bearer, we don't have to say yes. The question isn't who gets to do what to us. The question is, what are we being invited to participate in? And what is our answer? Will we give our consent to God's presence and action within us? <laughs>